welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. My name is Ketsi Diaz. I'm from the PD Art Library, or PD Library. And with me is Angela Hoffman and Laurel Koss. They're from the PD Art Center. Um, we're very excited about this program, not only because of, of our partnership together working on it, but um, also because of Leon's story and the amazing message that he's gonna share with you guys today. Um, Leon is a Holocaust survivor, and his family owned a chocolate factory. And his, he shared his story with many children at different schools, but this is his first time sharing at a library. Um, and then after Leon shares his story, we're gonna have an art project after that, so please stay for that. Um, and thank you again for coming, and let me introduce Mr. Leon Prochnick. So, my name is Leon Prochnick, usually mispronounced as Prochnick, but that's okay. Uh, I am a Holocaust survivor, and I want to thank you for coming here today. I also want to thank the Palos Verdes Library and, uh, and the Palos Verdes Art Center. Did I say that right? Oh, good. That's the hardest part. <laughs> so um, I just want to say a word about expectations. Uh, I started speaking a year ago, and I was not planning to do that in my lifetime. Um, I always felt like Holocaust survivors were like older people. And then one day I went, wait a minute, I'm an older people. <laughs> so it kind of surprised me. But then I, so I um, got invited to speak as a one-off um, talk to kids at the um, Museum of Tolerance in LA. I don't know if you've been there. How many of you have been to the Museum of Tolerance? It's a special place. It's totally worth a visit. They have a very beautiful Anne Frank exhibit that just recently went up. And um, so I spoke to middle school kids. And then I got a call from the museum. And the woman said, listen, those kids loved you. And I said, wow, that's so nice. She said, no, you don't get it. They really loved you. And I went, wow, OK, what does this mean? And then I got a packet of drawings that kids had done of my story. They took something out of my story. And as you'll see, because my story is very children friendly, uh, they did these fabulous, fabulous drawings. I'll pass some of this stuff around as I speak. Uh, and I thought, you know, this generation of kids now, that means you guys here, uh, you're about the last generation that's going to get to, if you do, to get to see a Holocaust survivor. Because there aren't that many left. And um, so that's one thing that struck me as challenging. And then I also thought kids today and I'm probably insulting some child right now as I speak, but kids today are not very interested in the Holocaust. The Holocaust is a very long time ago, even by adult standards. So it's distant, and if you're not Jewish, and you may be, you'll study it somewhere in school, they, they'll get you to read Anne Frank, and there will be like a one-day focus on it, <clears throat> and then it's going to be gone from your life, pretty much. That's very natural. Uh, but if you draw it, if you draw something that's connected with the Holocaust, you become a witness. You weren't there in person, thank God, but in the act of drawing, you make a different level of connection. You're not just a listener where you go, okay, I'm here today and afterwards we're going to go, you know, and have a snack or go have ice cream. So. <clears throat> I asked the children here to listen to my story as if you were part of the experience, also as if you were kind of journalists. So, because right afterwards, you're gonna get a chance to do a drawing of something in that story that speaks to you. And you'll end up getting a copy of that drawing, which you will really have for the rest of your life if you don't lose it. In fact, we're looking to have a book come out this year that will be full of children's drawings. I have hundreds and hundreds of drawings by now. And this is only the beginning. So I want to thank you all for being here. I do want to say that 
my vision of today, and that's why we shouldn't have too many visions, was going to be like 70 kids and about 20 adults. So we actually have a different kind of kid here today. But don't be fooled, because you're all kids. You will always be kids. I mean, I'll always be a kid. And in fact, I would suggest that if we have enough tablets or whatever available, those adults here in the room at the end, that you also do a drawing, if you could. It would be wonderful to have. And until now, it's all been kids' drawings. Uh, kids who are here, do you like to draw? Anybody? You see the hands wildly going up. No, we're not going to make come to the front of the room. You're not going to have to do anything like that. All right, so let's get into it, OK? When I, I'll talk for about 40 minutes or so. And then I want to leave time before we draw for questions, and because they're often the most interesting part of the program, something I have left out or didn't get a chance to get to and so forth. So here's the deal. Before World War II, my family owned the second largest chocolate factory in Poland. It was a big factory. The chocolate was named Suchard, the factory. And they made a chocolate, many chocolate bars, but the most popular one, I just got this box the other day. I thought it was a film some friend of mine was sending it. But no, inside, he had put a bar of Milka chocolate. Milka chocolate was the most popular chocolate that our factory made. And I think it is one, to, to, to today, it is one of the main chocolates in Europe. Looks like this. We can even pass it around if you like. Just don't eat it, OK? <laughs> this is my one boy at the end of one of my talks, as a, as a tribute to my talk, handed me a completely sweaty, melting chocolate bar. That was a great honor. It wasn't Suchard, but it was a great honor. Anyway, so, so because we were wealthy before the war, which was rare for Jews in Poland, most Jews in Poland were very poor. I mean, very poor. They lived in ghettos. I think you've seen photographs, and there are groups of Jews who dress like that now, you know, with the beards and the long black outfits, very easily recognizable as apart from the Polish uh, community in Krakow, which is where I was born. So Krakow, second largest city in Poland, and Suchard was the second largest chocolate factory in Poland. So because we're wealthy, we had a beautiful house where my mother's side of the family, 14 people, ranging in age from my grandparents who were in their 70s, to me and a cousin of mine who were six years old. That was the range, 14. My parents, aunts, uncles, and my sister. And so we had this beautiful house. And I had a very, very loving nanny, full-time nanny, which, if you know, if you were well-to-do, this is how you lived at that time in Poland. Full-time nanny who was Catholic. Uh, she was like my second mother, or in some ways like my first mother, because she spent 90% of the time I got to spend with her. If you, parents in those days used to see the children at dinner time and breakfast, but basically the, the, the day was spent with your nanny. So here was my loving Catholic nanny, who now and then actually snuck me off to church. Now, you were not supposed to do that. <laughs> that was not something, if you were a Jewish family, you would be very happy to hear. And Poland, by the way, at that time, uh, was quite anti-Semitic. There were many exceptions, of course, and many people who gave their lives during the war trying to save Jews. But the tone of Poland was anti-Semitic. And I've been asked, like, um, <clears throat> have you been back to Poland many times? Well, I'm going, I've been invited to go for the March of the Living this April. I will be in Poland. But until then, I was there only one time, which was 10 years ago, taken there by my wife, who also is not Jewish, who had the good sense to say, you should go to Krakow and see where you were born. So this is me. I'll pass this around. Ooh, me at the age of six. My mother used to dress my sister and me. That was just part of the 
the way you lived, you know, we're supposed to live. So I have Stefa, this wonderful nanny. I've got Hanusha, who is a full-time cook. Who today has full-time cooks? She was our full-time cook. She had this gleaming gold tooth at the front of the mouth that made her look like a pirate. She used to, and she adored me, and she would get into big fights with my father because she was willing to spend any amount of money to make me happy with food. And my father would say, you just pay $20 for a pound of strawberries when they're completely out of season, and that's, why did you do it? She said, because I'm not going to have my beloved little Lonechek, Lonechek was me, I'm not going to have my be beloved little Lonechek starve. And if I have to spend it, the money from my own pocket, I will make sure that he has the best of food. So and I went, well, that's good. You know, it sounded good to me. <laughs> we had fabulous vacations, endless vacations. I'd go skiing and I'd go swimming, you know, all these great things. And there were other pleasures. I remember it was almost like a ritual, me singing with my father. My father was a very good pianist. He'd come home from work. He'd automatically go over to the piano and I'd go right behind him, jump up on his shoulder and he would begin to play and I would sing. And the thing that I liked to sing the most were American songs. I did not understand one single word of what I was singing. My father had gotten <coughs> this out, <al> <coughs> excuse me, this album, and I'd be up there singing, heaven, I'm in heaven, and all these, I won't go on and bore you, but, but it was great. And, <coughs> but the very best thing for me, the very, very best, most exciting thing was my father would take me to the chocolate factory and I would sneak over to the chocolate tub where they melted the chocolate. And what did I do? What did I do? I stuck my arm in it, yes. <laughs> you left up rolling up the sleeve. Sometimes we, I had sleeves, some, but I stuck my arm into about here. And then I got to lick off every last, every last bit of that chocolate. And what happened to me? I got sick, how did you know? I'd get this terrible stomach ache and I'd go home and they'd give me cast, ca castor oil, horrible thing. And I'd go to bed and blah, 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 blah. And what did I do the next time I went to the factory? Exact, yes, exactly the same thing. So you get addicted very quickly when you have something like that in your life. And a big part of the story I'm gonna share with you today is about me and that chocolate tub. I got to call it Milka which is the name on the chocolate bar, which I hope has not been eaten and is being passed around. So please let the other side of the room have it. So I called her Milka. And then, this is the kind of life I envisioned would go on forever, you know? And, but something, someone named Adolf Hitler showed up. You know who he was? Kids, do you know who Hitler was? All right, this by the way is a picture of the factory as done drawn by kids. We can pass that around too. In fact, I'll pass around a few of these together. So look at all three, whoops, I'm messing everything up. This is Hitler, terrible, terrible, evil maniac who happened to also to be at that time the most powerful man in the world, or one of the most powerful men in the world. He hated everyone but what he considered 100% Aryans, which were, by his description, Germans, who were tall, had blue eyes, and were blonde, which was interesting, because Hitler was not tall, he had gray eyes, and he had dark hair. So, and he was in Germany, he was born in Austria. But it didn't matter, he was the ruler of Germany, and he was doing horrible, horrible things at that time in the world. The headline on the back of this says, it's like from 1935, Hitler deprived Jews of citizenship rights and he bans interracial marriages. That meant a Jewish person was not allowed by law to marry a German who was not Jewish. And the world stood by. 
people complained. They said, well, that's awful. You know, he's kind of extreme, extreme. But he won't be around that long. Well, he was a lot around long enough to cause the death of millions and millions of people. So Hitler, in the, I'll pass this here. We'll start on this side, OK? See the picture. And here, let me give you these with it. So Hitler decides to invade Poland. It's September 1st, I think, 1939. He invades Poland. And our family, our family of 14 people, is a, we're away on vacation. Traditionally, that time of the summer. <coughs> going to different places, but we're away on vacation. We get a telegram that says, do not come back to Krakow. The Germans are here, and they are looking for you. So kids, why are they looking for my family? Yes? Um, maybe so they can capture you? Well, yes, that would be an idea. That's close, yes. That you got it perfectly. We're Jewish and we're wealthy. Uh, what the Germans would do is that whatever country they would occupy, when it came to Jews, the first people they were looking for were wealthy Jews, so they could get their hands on these people's property, their houses, their factories, whatever they had. So we're told, do not come back here to Krakow. The Germans are here and they're looking for you. So all of you kids, but also all of you adults, think of what that's like. You have a lovely home. You have whatever your family has accumulated in terms of paintings or beautiful knickknacks or whatever you have in the house. And me and my sister have these lovely rooms with toys and whatever the kids have. And overnight, you realize you are not going back home. This is not a vacation from which you are returning home. What you are going to try to do now is to flee from the Nazis and do it as successfully as you can. It's kind of open. The hope is eventually to get out of Eastern Europe and end up maybe in Shanghai, South America, or the, hopefully, best of all, would be the United States. But it's not like you pick up the phone and you say, hello, I'd like to buy 14 tickets, you know, to get out of here. Because if you were traveling probably before the war, you know, and you had the money by conventional means, which in those days was mostly, mostly by boat, uh, very few people were flying, it would have probably taken you, say, maybe two weeks to get to the two, three weeks to get to the United States. It ended taking us a year and a half. We ended up going from Poland to Lithuania, to Russia, to Japan, to Canada, to the United States. Monumental journey, much of which, much of which or during which our lives were under threat because the Germans were already in Poland, we were escaping. So, and I'll pass this around here. Please, and let me give you one more. This again to show you what children did to uh, dramatize the story. Anyway, so we're escaping and I, several things happen. I develop a very, very serious, I develop a terrible ear infection, and there are no doctors. And I don't know if any of you have ever had trouble with your ears when you're a kid, but it hurts. It's right there up in your head, and if you don't even have aspirins, it's very, very, very bad. So what happens is that one night I have a dream, and Milka, the chocolate tub from the factory, is in the dream, and I don't know if a voice said it or I just figured it out. I put my ear, I put my ear against the side of Milka, 
and it's hot, but slowly the pain starts to go away. It's like somebody gave me a hot water bottle, you know, but better. So every night, especially because at night it was always worse, when my ear really hurt a lot, I would put it up against, come on, against the chocolate tub. And it, after a week or two, the infection was gone. My ear didn't hurt anymore. So I felt, as only a little kid can feel, that there was something magic about Milka. Because I already was like very interested in magic and, and, and wizardry. My sister had read me a book about a boy magician. And I thought, oh, that's definitely up my alley. Boy. I think a lot of kids have that idea that it would be nice to be a magician. Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah. OK. So here we are escaping. And not that much later, I have a dream about Milka again. And this time, a little man with a mustache. Who's that? Hitler, yes, is chasing me up. The, this dark staircase, and when he's almost caught up with me, there is Milka right at the top of the stairs, and I get to her just in time, and I upend her. Her chocolate is boiling, and I tip her over, and all the hot, burning chocolate spills on Hitler, and he goes screaming down the stairs. So now I'm feeling even more like I've got some magic powers, you know, it's the dream. But you know, also what's happened is that my governess has to leave us because she's Polish, she's Catholic, she's not going to be continuing this journey with us. And that's really devastating for me. That's like the loss of a mother besides the loss of everything that I knew in Krakow and the life I'd lived. So, and I have no friends because I haven't gone to school yet. I have cousins who I play with and my sister was four years older and thinks I'm a tremendous nudge, if you know that word. <laughs> Meaning she's, she thinks I'm a pain in the neck, you know, and I think she's a pain in the neck. So we have that kind of relationship. But uh, so I don't have friends. So Milka is a perfect friend for me because she's totally private to me. Nobody else knows about this. Nobody else is going to know about this. And it's, uh, that's my relationship with her. And what happens is, a few weeks later, we are being smuggled. You see, our lives are now in the hands of smugglers. You could not just pick yourself, oh, thank you. You could, oh, wait a minute, some of this is missing. No, it's all right. Great, it's not even melted. So you couldn't just go across Poland. You had to be smuggled. And that meant that these Smugglers who were like coyotes today, similar to Jewish, and you paid them. And you know, my mother had a diamond ring, my aunt had pearl necklace. We, whatever had to be, whatever we had, we the money was kind of pooled together and paid to pay for the being smuggled. Later, we connected with an uncle of mine who was in the United States. It was a bit later, and he was able to start sending us some money. Otherwise, you could not do it. And um, so we're being smuggled and just visualize this. So I'm like about six and a half years old by now. And we're, we come to the sentry point with German sentries. You've all seen it in movies, right? You've all seen the movies with the German soldiers, with the boots and the helmets. And I can tell you, even to a little boy, they were very, very frightening. They, because the Germans really knew how to do that. The German army did not look like the Polish army. I saw with my father the Polish army retreating when they surrendered. And there was not one car, there was not one motorcycle, there was not one mechanized unit. And one soldier had this color uniform and another one had that color for uniform. And they were all on foot and on crutches. The German soldiers all had the same uniform. And it was scary. And they're searching. They be, we're in a hay wagon. In those days, imagine you're still going by with hay wagons pulled by horses. It could be the 19th century. 
you know, here are four of us because the family's been split up into small units. So it's my mother, it's me, it's my aunt, and it's my cousin. And the German sentry is saying, do you have anything hidden in that hay in the back of this hay wagon? Because if, there's, if, if we find anything, we are going to take you out of this wagon and we're going to shoot you on the spot. Do you like that? I mean, think about that. Can you even imagine that happening? Right there in that moment, you know, it's not like you can say, well, this is unfair. Let's call our local senator or let's call the police. No, this is the police. And that's how they treat you, you know, especially if they suspect that you're Jewish. I had seen my mother hide her prayer book in the back of the wagon when we started out that morning. Her father had given to her, it was in Hebrew, and for her it was like precious. So she had hidden it in the wagon in the back, and I knew that if the German soldiers found it, we would be killed, yes, yes. I didn't know anything about politics. I didn't know exactly why this whole war was going on, but I knew who was going, who had the p power to kill us. And so I said to myself, I said, Milka, don't let them find my mother's prayer book. And they didn't find it. So my mother said, what happened was a miracle. They had all these guns with bayonets. They could have easily found, must be a miracle. And I thought, it wasn't a miracle. It was me asking Milka to see to it that the prayer book was not found. It's a very powerful feeling for a child. To the imagination, and I was a very imaginative kid, whatever else I was. I, I used to go around and I would stare at clouds and I would look at things and look at things and imagine things. And my mother would say, close your mouth. Your mouth is open. Because I'd walk around probably like this. You know, my sister said I looked like a moron. <laughs> little, little did she know what powers existed within me. <laughs> yeah, well, so, and so now we, we continue our escape, and this is, you've got to understand, freeze, it's getting freezing cold. We're going at night in a sled, smuggled. It is so cold that my parents are afraid that we, my sister and I, are going to freeze to death because I mean, you have, you have this icicles hanging down from, from whatever little thing you have on top of your head and you're wrapped in whatever shawls and things you have. But they're so afraid if we sit still that we will freeze to death. They, they make us stand on the runners of the sled, the back runners. You could hold on, but that kept you awake because you had to stay balanced, you had to stay there. So in a way, it was kind of fun. And at the same time, it was really scary. And you could hear wolves howling. And they were so nearby. You, you just felt any moment they're going to come jumping out of the woods. And I remember again saying, Milka, see to it that the wolves leave us alone, that they do not harm us. And no wolf came out of the woods. We weren't harmed. So what does that make me feel like? Like more of a magician or less of a magician? Come on, guys. More. More. More, yes. All right. So we get, have a similar experience. We're hiding in a barn. There's 14 of us. You're in a barn that's been abandoned. All you have, there is no heat. So you're all huddled up, you know, on the straw and whatever it is. And the door bursts open, and in come three Lithuanian soldiers with their guns out. Now, Lithuania was like Poland. It was also a country that was traditionally very anti-Semitic. And there were hardly any soldiers, Jewish soldiers, in the Lithuanian army. The Lithuanians didn't want them, and the Jews didn't want to be in the Lithuanian army. So it turns out, I say the same thing. I say, Milka, don't let the family get hurt. 
and it turns out that one of these soldiers is Jewish. Unheard of. I mean, there were probably, I'm exaggerating, but probably 50 Jews in the Lithuanian army, and this is one of them. And you know there's a language, most of you probably don't know this, there's a language called Yiddish. Are you familiar with it? Can I see hands? Do you guys know what Yiddish is? It's a, it's a kind of slang language that Jews created for themselves, a lot of German in it, a lot of Polish in it, it's a mixture of different languages. But in those days, back then, if you were Jewish and grown up, there, were the there was a chance that you spoke or at least you understood Yiddish. So you could go to any country, you could go to China, and you could come from Poland, and you too could talk in Yiddish. And one of these three soldiers, the Jewish one, speaks Yiddish, and my father starts talking to him in Yiddish, and my father gives him his watch, and my uncle brings out some vodka and pours it into this big cup, and they give it to the soldiers, and the soldiers drink it, and one of them plays something on a harmonica, and they leave us alone, alive. Otherwise, what they would do with you is they could either also shoot you on the spot or they would send you back to the German side and the Germans would take care of you. So we're spared. We're spared. When I tell this story, I'm you know, standing here in this beautiful library, Palos Verdes. It's almost hard to Im imagine that this was happening in the world, but it was. And we were very, very, very lucky in the case of my family, that I can share that story with you here today. But at the same time, it's a story that should not be forgotten. The Holocaust should not be forgotten. And that's why it's so important that I'm given this opportunity, and especially when in regard to kids, but grown-ups, of course, as well. So we escape, and finally we end up in Lithuania, you guys ever hear of Lithuania? You know, it's a, <clears throat> it, we go and end up in Vilno, Vilna, which is the capital. By that time, we've connected with my uncle in America, and he's giving us money, sending us money to survive on. But here's the deal. You can't go any further. Why? You go to go further east, you have to go through, anybody know the country? It's rather big. Russia. Right? You can't smuggle your way across Russia. You can't take a sled at night across Russia, because Russia is like about three times the size of the United States, or whatever it is, huge. So the only way you can go further is to get a transit visa. Adults here have all seen that movie Casablanca. Yes, can I see hands? You've all seen Casablanca, right? Remember, that's all they talk about are transit visas. Transit visas are the piece of paper you need if you are going to be able to go through a country that otherwise won't let you go through it. And the adults in my family, that's all they're talking about, is getting transit visas, getting transit visas. So by now I'm about seven years old. And of course, they don't tell the little kids anything, but at the same time, what little child doesn't listen and hear what the parents are saying? So I said to my sister one day, I said, Tell me what a transit visa is. And she said, oh, you're too young. You wouldn't understand. I said, you're always saying I'm too young. I won't understand. Tell me. So she tells me, and she explains that there's this thing called the Hitler-Stalin Pact, where Hitler has taken half of Poland, and Stalin has taken the other half. And right now, they're not at war. But if Hitler ever changes his mind and attacks, he'll be, his troops will be in Lithuania in a matter of days. And because we're Jewish, we are not going to survive that. So we have to get transit visas. So one night, I pray, or I say to Milka, help my family get transit visas. Now, you understand this is my dream of what I can do by asking that. What happens in reality, which is interesting, I mean, the coincidence of it, my father goes to get his weekly or monthly ration of cigarettes, and at the store, tobacco store, the guy, the man says to him, you know something amazing? There's a guy here in Vilno who is giving out transit visas to Jews. <laughs> How can that be? The government won't do it. 
You know, he's Japanese. He's at the Japanese consul. He's at the Japanese consul and of his own free will against the wishes, as it turns out, of the Japanese government who are allied with Germany. This man has decided out of the goodness of his heart, he has decided to give out 20 visas a day to Jews. So my father tells the family, my uncle and my, <clears throat> my cousin go to the J Japanese consul just packed with Jews outside, holding up little cards or signs saying, please give us a transit visa, please help us, you know, please help my family. And uh, eventually, because every day you get there, there are already hundreds of people there, they stay overnight and they eventually get this. This piece of fake paper is why I'm standing here today. This is a transit visa issued by Chiuni Sugihara, was the man's name. And once we had this, we were allowed to travel across the Soviet Union. We could travel across Russia. You couldn't buy this, no amount of money could get this for you. So, um, meanwhile, something very unexpected has happened. I'm put in school for the first time. I'm in, in a Lithuanian, I'm in a Lithuanian <coughs> Jewish Hebrew school and I can't talk to most of the kids because the kids speak Lithuanian or they speak Yiddish. I don't speak Yiddish, I don't speak Lithuanian, but there is one boy in the class and this makes a, you know, plays a big part in the story, if I can get it out of this folder. I have circled the picture here, you'll see it. At the top is me in my little suspenders, and at the bottom is my friend Oleg. Oleg speaks Polish. His mother is from Poland, and he is this really mischievous boy. You know, I was kind of serious, I mean not super serious, but I had never met a kid like him. He was the kind of kid who would, um, The teacher would ask him, you know, why he hadn't brought in his homework. And he would say, because there was precipitation and there was rain and the doctor said to the, that my mother said to her aunt, and he did this completely fast thing that the doctor, I mean, I'm sorry, the teacher couldn't follow. And she'd say, what's that? And he'd say, well, the frizzleblad went through the and then when it turned around, it doubled up into the hazelbaum. And double talk, which I'd never heard before. But he did it with such confidence that the teacher just dropped the subject. And I thought, this kid has really got cojones here. This is, this is a very special child. And so we became friends. And the next thing I knew, we, were, we got into school early one morning before anybody got there. And we do, on the blackboard, we drew this picture of our teacher on a broomstick. You know, that was very daring. <laughs> daring, daring, daring. Would have never done something like that. And then a few days later, we got, I don't know where we got them from, but we snuck in early and we put a wild strawberry on every kid's desk. So, yeah, he was like, he was very important for me. And here's the deal. When I find out <clears throat> that our family has gotten the transit visas, I say to him, so your family has got to get them too. And he said, what are they? knows nothing about them, has never heard about them. I said, this is a piece of paper, you've got to have it if you're going to get out of Lithuania. And he said, well, why would anyone get out of Lithuania? And I realized that his family, whatever they're doing, they're not thinking like my family. They're not thinking of escaping. And so I said, you've got to go home and explain to your parents that this is dangerous, they've got to get transit visas. So the next morning he comes into school and his eyes are all red. You can tell he's been crying. And I ask him what happened. He says, I told my father what you said. And he said that, that I was some kind of idiot, that I didn't know anything about anything, and that his family was not leaving the place where they had lived for, I don't know, 100 years. And they were not going to going anywhere because he had his little fruit stand and his parents lived there. And when Oleg kind of insisted or tried to say it again, he said, my father slapped me in the face and told me I was never to talk about this again. 
So that night I'm thinking, what's going to happen to them? If they're not going to try to escape, if they don't have transit visas, they're going to die. And so I summon up Milka. I mean, I, you know, I ask Milka to do something to save them. And I have a dream, and this was really scary. I have a dream where I'm in a field. It's like in a forest. I'm in a field, and there is Milka, and there is me. And then you hear gunshots and, and noise and yelling and shooting. And here comes Oleg with his parents running towards the tub. And I think, oh my god, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. They're going to get in the tub somehow, they're going to be safe. But as they run towards the tub, this tub starts to lift off the ground, like a helium-filled balloon, just starts to lift off the ground. I say, Milka, what are you doing? Wait for them. Milka doesn't wait, she goes up. They're trying to grab hold of her like she's about that high, and they're trying to grab hold of her, and the German soldiers come out of the forest shooting, and Oleg and his parents are killed. And I feel utterly, utterly betrayed. I never have had that feeling before, that something that was the most important thing to me in my life had totally betrayed me. Instead of waiting for them, I don't know what she could have really done if, besides it was a dream, but instead of waiting for them, she purposely just makes it impossible for them to get into her. So a day or so later, we leave. We leave for the Soviet Union, for Russia. We go on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Have you ever heard of it? All right. In those days, I don't know how it is now. I'm sure it's all been fixed up. <clears throat> 12 days and 12 nights. 12 days and 12 nights to get from Moscow to Vladivostok. Vladivostok, if I had a map, it's all the way at the bottom of the Soviet Union. It's the port city that faces towards Japan. We're given a little compartment, my parents, my sister, and me, just like a little, you know, little room on a train. And at night, you can take the two benches that face each other. There's like a little table in the middle. And you can take those benches and make them into beds. And then if you climb up this little ladder, there are bunks above the benches where my sister and I sleep. And my parents sleep down below. And I don't know how many nights into the trip, but one night I look out the window of the train, and there is, who's there? Who could it be? Yes. Yes, how did you figure that out? Because it's the only one. <laughs> yeah, the most likely suspect. But you know, it's amazing. It's like, you, it's kind of hard to visualize. It's like she's floating alongside the train. You know, not like on wheels or anything, but just we're moving and she's moving. It's like she wants to come back, like she wants to reconnect. And I don't want to have anything to do with her. You know, and I, so I even pulled down the blind and my mother says, why are you pulling down the blind? We're not ready to go to sleep. And I said, well, I'm tired. And she said, well, put it back up. You know, we all go to sleep together here. And so it stays. Every night, if I look out the window, there's Milka. And it's very upsetting for me. And I talk to my father about it. I, he sees that I'm upset. He asks me what's wrong. And I say, Dad, if you have a best friend and that friend betrays you, what do you do about it? And my father said, well, the first thing I would do is I would find out what they actually did and why they did it, and if they really betrayed you or whether you were just imagining it. And I said, no, I know for sure they betrayed me. Then my father says, well, then don't have anything to do with this friend. And I said, well, but he keeps following me. <laughs> and my father said, he keeps following you like, like he's on this train? Because there were refugees on the train, like us who were fleeing. And I said, no, he's not on the train. And my father says, oh, OK. So it's your imagination. You've, you've always been very imaginative. You know, you're always thinking of, of something. <clears throat> he said, so if it's in your imagination, you can unimagine it. I'd never thought of that. 
So that night, when I went out of the, a little cabin, our compartment to go to the to pee, to go to the bathroom, uh, I looked out the window, there was Milka, and I said to her, listen, stop following me. You don't exist, I'm making you up. You, I don't want you to follow me anymore. I don't want to see you, I don't want, I don't want you to be part of my life. And then the next night, was Milka there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And the night after? Yes. And the night after that? Yes. The only thing that was happening was she was growing dimmer. She was getting fainter. She was getting more ghost-like. And eventually, on the fourth night or fifth night, I looked out the window <clears throat> and Milka was gone. And there was this feeling like, oh. I didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. Because I was glad in a way that I was rid of her. And it was also like losing your best friend. And besides, now life changed. Because after coming to the bottom of Russia, Vladivostok, we took a boat to Japan. We were in Japan for about a week. It was all, I mean, you know, a seven-year-old boy, you're seeing things you've never seen before. People, <clears throat> they have colds, they're all wearing masks, and the streets are immaculately clean. And my family finds the only kosher restaurant in Tokyo. <laughs> Go figure. Because there was like a chain. People who were traveling across, who told the people who were following them, you know, what was where, and so forth. So I didn't even have time to think of milk. And no, our lives were no, you could tell by the time we got to Japan, our lives were no longer in danger. We were still escaping, we were still trying to get somewhere. But the heavy, scary feeling was gone. And then from Japan, we take a boat to Canada. Canada, I mean, first thing, they put me in a school, and I notice that every child in my class is a genius. <laughs> every child in that class can speak about 100 words of English a minute. I don't know any of them. I don't speak any English. All those songs I sang with my father, those were all memorized songs. They had nothing to do with knowing the language. So there's that feeling. And also, you know, not all life, no matter how serious it is, there are always like funny things that happen, even in the worst situations. We were put in this little hotel, and the first morning in Canada, we go down to the dining room, and it's the first time in my life I've ever seen cornflakes. There were no cornflakes in Eastern Europe. It did not exist. And I wanted to order them, but I didn't kind of dare because I thought that they would be very, very expensive. And you know why I thought that? And this is after having the fanciest cook, you know, be our personal cook in Poland. Because I thought that each cornflake was handmade. <laughs> I thought each cornflake was taken by somebody and chipped out, make a little thing here and a little thing there. So needless to say, this was going to be very expensive. And then somebody said, no, 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 they're made by machine. You can have it. So I had my fir first cornflakes ever. It, you know, so that was great. Um, the only time I thought of invoking Milka was I was told that I would have to have my wisdom tooth taken out. Those days, I don't know how, they had actually a dentist at the school. This is like 1940, quite amazing. I had to go home, get a note signed by my parents, and all night up, I was up and I was thinking, oh my God, they're gonna pull out this tooth, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be awful. And then I remembered that on the train, I had heard one of the refugees, some man, because people talked, you know, they would meet in the, in the corridor of the train or in the dining room, and he was telling stories about the wonders of the new world, the wonders we would find when we got to Canada and America. This was just a different place in Europe. And one of the things he described, or I could swear that's what I heard, was that in Canada or America, if you had to have a tooth pulled out, they didn't yank it out with a pair of pliers. The dentist felt the back of your neck, awesome. felt around till he found the right nerve or muscle or whatever it was. And then the dentist pushed right there and the tooth popped out. <laughs> 
I mean, was this a great place? I mean, this was amazing. <laughs> so the ne next morning I show up, you've got to visualize me. I'm seven, so I'm about this tall. And I go in there and I give my note to this huge dentist. And I say to him, I say to him, push, push, push. And he says, no, pull, pull, <laughs> pull. That's how I learned the word pull, by the way. And, so, and I lost my wisdom tooth. But all in all, you know, this was an amazing new life. Now, now we were <clears throat> pretty much safe. Oh, yeah, one other thing. When I got to, when I got to uh, Canada, all the boys were wearing uh, pants that looked like jodhpurs. I don't know if you know what that is, but they look like these riding pants that flare out at the side, and then they come straight down to your shoes. I was wearing short pants and woolen stockings, which made me look like a complete geek. I was so embarrassed to walk in in short pants and stockings. And I went home crying to my mother, you've got to help me, you've got to do something. So she went running around to refugee services, and they got me the right, she finally got me the right pair of pants. And right after she got me the right pair of pants, we were admitted to America. We finally could go to America, and we got to America where my uncle was, and guess what? The boys were not wearing these riding pants. They were wearing pants that were called knickers. They were sort of balloony pants. They came down to here, and then there was a sock. And guess how I felt? <laughs> like a total geek again. A real dork. I had to go home crying to my mother. She got me the right pants. But you know what the thing was? I knew that the journey was over. I remember that first night, they put us up in this old hotel somewhere, and here we are in this little temporary apartment. My father, my mother, my sister, and me, and my father comes to say goodnight, and I said to my father, is this it? Is this it? And he knew immediately what I was talking about. And he said, yeah, this is it. No more running. No more having to pick ourselves up and go and go and go and go. This is it. And that was like the first night since we had begun our escape that I didn't go to sleep clutching my pillow. I was like, home. This is home. I don't care if it's a tiny apartment. I don't care about any of that stuff. We're home. And so that pretty, I mean, I could go on for hours with many sub stories here, but I think this gives you an idea of what this journey was like. And Milka did not appear to me again in a dream to almost 30 years later. It was, I think, when I'd seen the first movies were starting to come out all that many years later about the Holocaust. There wasn't stuff right after the war. I mean, there were newsreels and stuff, and uh, you know, the Nuremberg trials, and then it was like over, and nobody wanted to talk about it. So I saw, a movie, I think it was The Sorrow and the Pity, I saw a documentary, and then I had a dream one night with Milka. And in my dream, Milka was gigantic. She wasn't a tub. She was as big as a lake. I couldn't see to the other side of her. That's how big she was. And maybe because she was so familiar to me, I didn't ask what she was doing here or why she was so huge. I took off my clothes and I climbed into her climbed into the tub, and I began to swim. And strange swimming through chocolate is a very strange experience. <laughs> it was gooey and it was hot, but as I swam, the chocolate got cooler and got lighter and lighter until it looked like water. It was water. It was kind of sweet water. And I swam, and I looked down into the tub, and I could see my parents looking up at me from the water saying, yes, Keep swimming, good, keep going, swim. And under there, I imagined that there were these huge mounds of that un beneath which were the bodies, so I imagined, of Jewish <coughs> children. The thousands and ultimately millions of them that had been killed during the Holocaust, who had not been as lucky as my family had been. And it was as if they were saying, don't forget us. Remember us. Keep us in your memory. We were alive once, and we were murdered. We were killed. And so here I am, a half a lifetime after that dream, and I'm still swimming. I don't know if I'll ever get to the other side. There probably isn't another side. Just swimming, 
and sharing my story of this experience with you, which I hope you have laid in, and I hope that you will do some wonderful drawings. So, one last thing, because kids, you're going to get a chance to draw now. Do <laughs> you know how they hate